Lucy Clark. As a long-time science fiction fan, I'm very sorry I can't be with you today. But I'd like to welcome you to this preview of 2010 Odyssey 2. For the last year, I've been working with Peter Hyams and MGM on this movie, which I'm very excited about, and I hope you will be as well. So sit back and enjoy this preview of my next Odyssey to the moons of Jupiter and beyond. The monumental task of bringing 2010 to the screen began in May 1983, when writer-director Peter Hyams started work on the screenplay. During the script writing process, Hyams and Clark exchanged ideas via computer link-up between Hyams' office in Los Angeles and Clark's home in Sri Lanka. I was, uh, of course, very interested in seeing what the screenplay would be like as compared to the novel. And indeed, he had done one or two things which if I taught him at the time, I would have probably incorporated in the novel. Maybe the best way of collaboration is for the two people to be on opposite sides of the world, not to see each other until it's all over. Sid Mead brought his unique design talents to 2010. The hardware, the interior of the Leonoff, the, the general technical look, very much the complex in space, minimal cost for the maximum utilitarian value. If I had to describe in one word the, the look of the hardware that I uh, designed for 2010, it would be the word functional. Production designer Albert Brenner worked with Mead to combine form and function in the visuals of the film. It's literally designed by engineers, not by designers, interior designers. Wherever you can find a space to put a bunk and a person in, that's where you'll put them. So what we're doing is basing everything we do on known research today. What we're doing today and what the research tells us is probable tomorrow. The credits of visual effects supervisor Richard Edland include the Star Wars trilogy, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Poltergeist, and Ghostbusters. 2010 is not going to necessarily look like 2001. In fact, it won't look like 2001. Uh, certain things we, you know, are in that were in 2001, such as the Discovery, will reappear, and Jupiter uh, is going to look like you've never seen it before. There will be poetic license taken, but uh, it won't be. Uh, it, there won't be absurd license taken. Model shop supervisor Mark Stetson. Records of the Discovery were all destroyed. The Discovery miniature from 2001. Now, Mr. Kubrick was concerned about. Uh, the discovery appearing in later science fiction films. We had the models destroyed, all the plans and drawings were destroyed. But our main source of information is, uh, is a print of uh, 2001 itself. Peter Hyams and a seasoned crew began principal photography on 2010 in February 1984. With a 71-day shooting schedule, 2010 emerged as one of the largest scale productions of the year. Being asked to be in 2010 was like completing a circle. The quality of the character in, in 2010 is slightly different because the plane of existence is different. Uh, the character I play is no longer embodied. He's in a very strange state, so his concerns are quite different. The other most unique experience for me on this film was walking on to the reconstructed bridge and the reconstructed pod bay uh, from the original Discovery. It was like walking back in time. It was like a space war. Mike Westmore is a member of Hollywood's famous Westmore family of makeup artists. I took a cast of my mother's face, who is 82, and uh, my next-door neighbor is 91. And I went over with my camera and photographed her rolls of film on him. It's like it's a combination. It's my mother's neck, uh, my next-door neighbor's eyes, and things like that. Well, it's all make-believe, folks. This English uh, flying wizard who's worked out this amazing system it takes three men to fly one, and uh, then you move yourself every other way just by shifting your weight. You spun around and twisted and turned. Just loved it, traveling about 20 miles an hour across the sound stage. Jim, 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 Jim. They really have to move. Okay, that's number one. Two, this tether has to come around the other side because it's violating this man. Okay, back to number one, please, everyone. Yes, they kept telling me, John, just calm down up there. Astronauts in space, don't clown around. <laughs> in this movie, I play a character named Dr. Chandra, who finally gets a chance in this movie to uh, go to Jupiter, where Hal is right now, and find out what's going on. 
it's really great fun to, to escape into something like this. I mean, I always wanted to fly, and I wish I could have told myself when I was six or seven, I wish I could have said, hey, it's really interesting, because when you get to be a grown-up, you might actually get to do some of these things. Acting in the film is really being a small part of, a, of an enormous uh, technological wonder. Just the very quality of the sets. I think, for me, the minute I walk onto these sets, like we are here, I think it helps us more than we, we know as actors. Among the many challenges facing the 2010 crew was creating the illusion of weightlessness. In this scene, Himes and Scheider attempt to show ordinary objects afloat in zero gravity. If you, if you correct the axis of it to put it there, it'll look like you're yeah. placing it there. Yeah. Gotcha. Marco. We have enough fuel in the Discovery for a launch. We have enough fuel in the Discovery for a launch. You have enough fuel in the Anoff for a trip home. You have enough fuel in the Anoff for a trip back home. Discovery. You, you have enough fuel aboard the Leonov for the trip home. Uh, <laughs> I'm so amazed by this. <laughs> the fact that this movie has as a, you know, its underlying theme, the fact that we got to get along together uh, is, I think, an immediate concern to all of us. Well, the plot of the film involving a Russian-American voyage Peter has gone and scared up these marvelous Russian actors. This guy who plays Max, the, the person who becomes an instant friend of Kurnow's. We've become instant friends. Elia and I, we sit around, he teaches me how to say cow and horse and cat in Russian. Uh, I'm taking advantage of the situation and never teach him dirty words. <laughs> <laughs> the two of us represent detente in this movie. <laughs> Bringing 2010 to the screen involved a massive team effort both in front of and behind the cameras. 90% of the film was shot on MGM's two largest sound stages in Hollywood, with a week of locations shooting in New Mexico and Washington, D.C. The scope of the production involved an attention to detail in all areas from the largest set to the smallest miniature. And while the finished film will boast new highs in technical achievement, the promise of 2010 lies in Arthur C. Clarke's exciting story. It's about something that, that, that not only could happen, it's about something that we'd love to actually happen because we're so hopeful. And I don't think that there's anything more primal, at least in, in me, than, than the fascination with making contact. To me, the, uh, the monolith is some kind of expression of that unbelievably advanced intelligence. Uh, that's expressed in both films. Because it's not defined, it allows you to imagine it to be anything you want it to be. People who ask you what the monolith means, I have a simple answer. I say, if you must see the film, read the book, and repeat the dose as often as necessary.